This is Spencer with The MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by director Kimberly, Kimberly Pierce. Let's get that nice and clear. Um, you might know her from Boys Don't Cry. You might know her from Stop Loss. She's now directed the new Carrie uh, update. Um, I wanted to start, though, by sort of a little bit of a bigger picture in that. Before you approach this project, were you a horror fan? Did you love the original Carrie? Had you read the King book? Or was this something that you sort of embraced as the opportunity got to you? Well, the, the answer is yes to all the original questions, which is I, um, I'm a huge horror fan. I love, you know, Stephen King, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. I love The Omen. I love Rosemary's Baby. I love... Um, Halloween, all that stuff. You know, yeah, all that stuff is just is really fantastic and fun. I just I love the thrill ride that you get with horror. Mm. Uh, but I'm also a Stephen King fan, so I was a big reader as a kid, uh, literature student at University of Chicago. You know, I've read a lot of Stephen King's books, and in particular, have read uh, Dance Macabre, which is this mm. amazing uh, group of. Uh, it's this amazing book that he put together, looking at horror in radio, TV film and literature and it will blow your mind wow just his encyclopedic knowledge of it and just how entertaining it is very cool and his book on writing so but of course the the carrie book is just one of my all-time favorites yeah really a definite defining one especially for him i mean it launched his career was that sort of an intimidating um idea to come into then i mean you're a fan of the genre you love the original material I'm not going to say, like, your past work would make it more difficult, but your past work was much more personal, much more sort of grounded in reality. What was that sort of transition like in sort of, like, mentally preparing yourself to do this once you got the project? I mean, of course it's going to be daunting. It's a classic, and particularly because I love story and I love characters, and I'm madly in love with Carrie White, this misfit social outcast who wants what we all want, which is love and acceptance, and just has a hell of a time getting it. At school with the kids who give her a hard time, with her mother who loves her deeply but is terrified that she's evil and has fundamentalist uh, nature to her upbringing, which is challenging. I love the mother-daughter story. You know, I love uh, that Carrie loves her mother and is trying to break free but always in conflict with her. I love the superpower origin story. She's discovering that she's got these powers and kind of like a a talent that's going to kind of make the world maybe okay for her. And then the Cinderella nature of it. So she mm. goes to the prom and she... <laughs> Very she different wear, end of that ball. <laughs> well, exactly. She wants to wear the beautiful dress. Uh, she wants to dance with the handsome boy. She wants to have that dream night come true. And interestingly, our relationship to her is we want her to succeed. We want her to have the most amazing night. We love it when she gets prom queen. But at the same time, we're also waiting for it to all come collapsing down. We love that the Cinderella story is turned on its head, which is a really interesting thing that we, we want to see her at her moment of absolute joy, and then we want to see it all taken away from her. And then we want to see her get angry and upset, and we want to see those powers leak out, because I think at the end of the day, we love a sense of justice. We love a revenge tale. It's, it's sort of interesting. And one of the sort of interesting, um, I don't know if, I, can, I mean, I'm going to paraphrase because I don't know the direct quote, but I saw someone talking about how you, you've said that you love The Godfather because it's a family drama within a gangster film. I think that's a really eloquent way of describing it. Uh, do you sort of see sort of um, a similar sort of perspective towards this film? You're talking about these underlying stories. I mean, uh, o- overarching, there's obviously this revenge story, but there's all sorts of things, you know, the mother-daughter story you talk about. Um, was that one of the things that really hooked you with this is that on the surface it's just like this elaborate revenge story but really there's quite a bit of heart and pain and all sorts of emotional underlying parts absolutely I mean, of course I love that it's a horror movie and that I get to tap into that genre I love that it's a revenge tale and that's really fun but for me it's always about character and story so it's always about a, a protagonist that I absolutely love because they to me are the engine that drives the story so her desire for love and acceptance the fact that she'll do anything to get it the mm-hmm. fact that she'll even put herself at risk when she knows she's got these superpowers I mean you have an engine there that is ferocious and is entertaining so Of course, I love Carrie, then I love Carrie and her mother, and then I love Carrie and then the girls who torment her, but Mm -hmm. then, of course, one gets guilty, and rather than apologizing to Carrie, which is what we know she should do, 
she does what rich people do. She has privilege, and she says, why don't I donate my boyfriend to you? Yeah. That's not a good solution, but it's it's a solution. It's a half measure that powers the story. I love the bad girl, Chris. Yeah. I love that every That's time one. somebody takes up Carrie's cause, Chris gets anger and anger and escalates her attack. So you're right. It's it's all the layers that are what attract me to it. Carrie's kind of an interesting character in the genre of horror because on one hand she's a victim and on the other hand she's kind of a villain i mean if you consider the last perspective of the last half of the film um what is it like sort of trying to create a character that's empathetic uh, uh, yeah sort of fits in both camps you know because it'd be very easy to skewer as just purely a victim or just purely as this ferocious villain was it like sort of trying to balance that and make her empathetic to audiences but I think you've hit the, the nail on the head, which is I think rather than actually thinking of her as a victim or a villain, to think of her as a protagonist. Because really what a protagonist is is somebody that we love deeply and who undergoes something, right, and then has to take a retaliation or has to take an action in response to that. So if we empathize with Carrie, if we love her and we want to see the dream come true, then when the dream is destroyed, we want her to take revenge. So to me, the... The revenge tale only could work if you love the main character, and that was why it was so important to cast Chloe Moritz, because she makes you want to adopt her. You want to take her in, and it's true. Everybody was like, you're going to fall in love with her. Do you want to talk to the other directors who worked with her? And I was like, I don't want to talk to the other directors that worked with her. I want to have my own relationship with her, and why, why do I need to fall in love with her, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, cut to, oh, I'm totally in love with Chloe. I want to adopt her. It's just she has that effect on you, which is probably because of who she is she's inherently charismatic she's charming she's such a hard worker i love that in an actor she's so good at but also she's in a really wonderful family and they give her that so mm -hmm. it's a very interesting thing to see somebody so ensconced in the entertainment business but in a way so protected one of the sort of interesting challenges i would sort of perceive from the outside of this film is the last half of this film is so iconic and so beloved what was it like trying to basically work out a first half that would keep people engaged and not just constantly being like when's she gonna go crazy looking forward to carrie going crazy because it seems like that was would be what everyone would look forward to with this film coming out but well, you have to build up to that i always think the best thing you can do really when you face a problem which filmmaking is nothing but problems <laughs> i mean it just is you wake up every day you know what you say how am I going to get the equipment? How am I going to get the actors? When's the equipment coming in? You know, how am I going to get my shots done? And it's never that you wake up and, and it's all solved. It's always difficult. So I think that in particular, if you're saying, well, how am I going to structure the first half because I know that they're waiting for the revenge tale? Well, then you embrace the challenge and you say, okay, why don't we just accept the fact that there is a major gear that's going to kick in in the second half that everybody wants to happen and that they want to get there yeah. as quickly as possible. So in fact, when you're editing it, you're looking at your watch and you're saying, mm. this thing has to be tight, it has to be lean, and we have to get to that point quick enough. Well, what do we have to do before we get there? We gotta get you to fall in love with the protagonist, we've gotta get you to care about her circumstances and wanna see her succeed, we gotta get you engaged in that mother-daughter relationship that they love each other, but they're at odds. So, oh, I can add some ferociousness there. I can add some conflict and some fighting there. That'll keep them engaged until we get to prom. I can add the superhero origin story. Oh, here's a girl who's a misfit and, and her superpower is the only thing that's going to make her feel good in the world. Let me add some scenes. Let me add some exploration. And let's make the superhero, let's make the superhero aspect of it engaging. So I'm using the mother-daughter relationship to stoke your interest mm. and to heighten your investment. I'm using the superhero origin story to get you engaged. But you're waiting in the back of your mind for the revenge tale. Yeah. And I'm making you invested in the Cinderella tale, knowing that the better the Cinderella tale is, the more satisfying the revenge. Do you think it's a really key um, decision in picking you, someone who had an investment in the project, or in just Carrie in general, because it could be a crutch to have that, like end scene everyone knows it's like oh as long as we really knock that one out people aren't going to care what we do first but to have somebody who actually passionately cared about telling carrie's story to make it a f film that's more than just a s one yeah. great scene i think so and and i also think that the one great scene can never be a great scene unless the lead-up is great to it i mean i just think movies are 
they're just a, a series of dominoes. And that was why I added a new scene in the beginning, which uh, I, we're not going to tell yeah, anybody what uh, it is. Yeah. But I'm really proud of that because I was reading the book and I was like, my God, this is the... This is the opening scene. So I wrote that. I talked to Julianne. She was like, if you can get them to pay for it, let's shoot it. <laughs> and that's always, you know, that's part of my job is to, in the best sense, is to understand the mechanics of the story and to explain to the studio, guys, this is where we should start because this is where that relationship begins and that relationship is the spine of the movie. So I feel pretty confident that when they came to me, they knew I would be passionate. They knew that I would make sure, you know, and... and working on the adaptation and rewriting it, make sure that the story works. And I love actors. I mean, it is just, I'd say I love writing, but I, I also love act, you know, acting and actors. So I hopefully, what they saw was the, the fact that I would take it seriously and, and be utterly respectful to the classic because I feel I have to deliver. And then, of course, I bring in Julianne, I bring in Chloe, Judy Greer. I uh, love Judy Greer in the movie. Judy Greer. She's great. Yeah, she's fantastic. human. She's funny. I'll tell you anything about Judy Greer is so great. When I first met her for lunch, um, she was already telling me the character. And I was like, oh, wow, wow. So you've done a lot of thinking about the gym teacher. And I was like, well, wh what do you think? And she was like, I have it all worked out. She was just like, I don't really care about my job anymore. She's like, I'm coming to school and I'm not even wearing the gym outfit. I said, okay. And she's like, and I'm probably smoking in the, uh, the hallway you know, in the intermissions. And she's like, I'm basically focused on going to Mexico with my friends because that's what I save my money for <laughs> is my vacations. So I'm in love with her at this that's point. That's fantastic, yeah. But then she's also saying, but then I fall in love with this girl. Like I, I, she said, I get so angry when those girls do that to her and I just want to protect her and take her under my wing. And she said, I stop thinking about going to Mexico. Yeah, she has a way of transitioning between comedy and drama that is just phenomenal and basically everything she does she does it, such a subtlety that it's, it, it's incredible. wonderful and it's infectious and it's why when she then takes on essentially a moral role of taking care of Carrie you don't find it annoying you find it engaging you find it endearing because she's layering it with humor and it's the same thing with Julianne Margaret White is a very intense character she loves her daughter she fights with her daughter she mutilates herself yeah. right which is a, a whole new thing that we added. Yeah. She bangs her head. She cuts herself. Yeah, the cutting was really intense. It's great, right? Yeah. She's digging into her yeah. leg. Oof. Well, so a character like that could be kind of one-dimensional. But mm -hmm. just like with Judy Greer, you bring in Julianne Moore, who's such a fantastic actress, has so much warmth, has so much depth, and all of a sudden that's a three-dimensional character who you care about. What was the learning curve in terms of executing that final sequence? I mean... <laughs> Not to say that, like, directing is, I mean, just a flat plane, you know, you understand everything once you've directed a movie, but, like, your first two films were not supernatural, let's say, so there's probably a lot of practical effects, a lot of CGI, special effects, all sorts of stuff to execute that final sequence. What was it like in terms of getting up to speed to make that to your satisfaction? Was it just a, an element of watching other people's work and sort of breaking it down? Was it getting the right people involved? What was that like? Well, I was lucky in that on my last movie, Stop Loss, because it was a war film, I had a lot of guns, I had a lot of explosions, mm -hmm. I had a lot of shooting, I had people being blown up, moving through the air. So I had done wire work, I had done explosions. That stuff I was familiar with, and I had already worked on green screen. This was obviously of a whole other order, so what I did was I studied as many films, recent films as I could to understand how they, they work. I made sure with Dennis Berardi, who runs Mr. X in Canada, that I was in his studio all the time saying, show me what the effects are going to look like. Mm -hmm. And then I started to really think and be able to write in the digital realm, right? So for instance, there's things in the, the movie that I don't think you've seen before. So a girl, you know, Carrie has to stop the villains from getting away. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have, she can't fly. She doesn't have a gun. She doesn't have a rope. So she has the ability to displace the world. So she stamps on the ground mm -hmm. and she creates a fissure. Well, that's not something I'd ever seen, but... I go back to physics in the natural world, and so I gathered all these images of the atomic bomb explosions, mm -hmm. so I understood how her powers emanated out. Then I also got uh, earthquake photos, so when you saw wow, cool. these gashes in the earth that nature had made, I sent them to Dennis and I said, everything has to come from physics, okay, now let's work backwards, let's get a storyboard artist in, Let, let's come up with lots of images, I do that, okay, this is what it should look like, but that's how I write. And then also, let's get some great storyboard artists. Right, And then let's bounce these ideas around. So let's draw the action figures. Let's draw the storyboards. Let's have the visuals. Now he starts doing something called an animatic, which is great. So 
he cartoonizes my pictures <laughs> and they make them move in in real time, right? And he cuts them up and all of a sudden he has like an actor, you know, go in and do voices. And you begin to see it in a three-dimensional realm mm. and you're like, that needs to move faster, that gash needs to be bigger, this, you know, that spatially doesn't work. So you're writing it and you're directing it in yeah. an animation, then they start sending it back and that's when you really start working on timing. Okay, or like the knives. Oh, yeah, yeah. She lifts the knives and they come around and I was like, oh, well that's like stuff I've seen in Fantasia. So I'm pulling from, you know, from <laughs> Fantasia. Uh. But also, what's the great Steven Spielberg movie? What's the great one? The guy has the rope and the one has the gun. Indiana Jones. Yeah. Yeah, it was right? Raiders of the Last... No, is that what? I don't want to get it wrong. Yeah. So a brilliant Spielberg, Indiana, yeah. Raiders, but it's that moment of all these things line up and you're like, oh God, this is going to get me. Well, that... Um, I said what well, was like in Fantasia and in other movies where uh, if a bunch of airplanes were lifting off the ground and they were all being controlled by the same person mm. and they went into a formation, so we put the knives into a formation. Well, those are words to begin with. Interesting. But then you talk to your CG people and you say, let's see the choreography of that. And mm. actually, I, I started doing it, um, I would say to them, guys, just move little green dots through the frame because when you go to what's called a full render, it's just, it's exhausting to everybody. Yeah, it's expensive. Yeah. So I'm like, show me the green dots. Like, And they're like, no, 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 you're the director. We want you to see it all finished. And I'm like, guys, I watch rehearsals. Mm. You know, I need to see bodies moving through space and time. So it was an uphill learning curve, but it was just a blast to make it as exciting as possible. Maybe an animated film is what should be next. Yes. Um, so the film comes out October 18th. Yes. Uh, nationwide. Um, what is next for you? Do you have anything that... Or any place that people should keep track of what you're up to? Uh, well, I, Twitter or anything? Yeah, you can track me on Facebook. That's a good way. You know, I'll post a lot of stuff. I I have a very fantastic fan site, and I have a great uh, site that somebody did called KimberlyPierce.com, but we're in the, the moment of updating them, so I, mm. I don't think that they should go there yet. Just go to my Facebook page. I post everything, and I'm working on an amazing cyborg movie. Sounds awesome. And a... Uh, and then a romantic sex comedy. We'll see if I can get uh, that the one Judd done. The Judd Apatow thing. Yeah. That, was, that sounds pretty cool. Um, thank you so much, Kimberly. I wish you the best of luck with Carrie and whatever come next. And uh, check out more reviews at MacGuffin. That's MacGuff.in. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. It's don't even try to bite the sun. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.